Hi, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donohue reporting for Medscape. Joining me today is Dr. Paul Ritker. He's the Eugene Brunwell Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's also the Director of Cardiovascular Prevention Program uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's going to be joining me today to discuss a very important and emerging topic, which is the use of low-dose colchicine. I think there's a lot of interest in the use of this drug, um, which has now both got a, a U.S. Um, FDA indication, which we'll talk about further, um, and has also now been um, written into both European as well as uh, American guidelines that have been recently released. But I think a lot of people are talking about where this fits into our cu current armamentarium, and I think there probably no, is no better person to discuss this than Paul Ritker, who's really been at the forefront um, of research into anti-inflammatory therapeutics. So th thank you for joining me, Paul. Michelle, it's a pleasure to be with you on Netscape today. So as we think about the concept behind use of colchicine, now we've obviously done a lot of research into lipid-lowering drugs, but, but where does colchicine now fit in? Sure, so let's make sure we get the basics down. Uh, Anti-inflammatory therapy is going to be added on top of quality other care. This is not a replacement for lipids. It's not a change in diet, exercise, and smoking cessation. The new data are really telling us that a patient who's aggressively treated to guideline recommended levels can still do a lot better in terms of preventing heart attack, stroke, cardiovascular death, revascularizations by adding low-dose colchicine as the first proven anti-inflammatory therapy for atherosclerotic disease. I have to say, Michelle, for me, it's been a wonderful end of a journey in many ways, because this story starts almost 30 years ago for quite a few of us thinking about inflammation, atherosclerosis. The whole CRP story is still an ongoing one. Uh, we recently showed, for example, that residual inflammatory risk in some 30,000 patients all taking a statin was a far better predictor of the likelihood of more cardiovascular events, in particular cardiovascular death than was residual cholesterol risk. Now think about that. We're all aggressively ag ag giving second lipid-lowering drugs in our very sick patients, but that means inflammation is really the untapped piece of this. Um, the two clinical trials we have in front of us, the Colcott trial and the Ladoco 2 trial, both New England Journal of Medicine papers, both roughly 5,000 patients, very clear evidence that uh, following a relatively recent myocardial infarction, that's Colcott, in chronic stable atherosclerosis, that's Ladoco 2, we're getting 25 to 30% relative risk reductions in major adverse cardiovascular events on top of aggressive statin therapy. That's a big deal. Uh, and it's safe and it works. And it's fully consistent with all the information we have about inflammation being part and parcel of atherosclerosis. So it's a pretty exciting time. Yeah, I, I think it really beautifully, um, you know, proves the the inflammatory hypothesis in many ways. Um, and and you know, you led Cantos. That was a much more specific um, target. Um, here, in terms of the effects of of colchicine, what do we know about how it may work on on the inflammatory cascade? Sure. So our Cantos trial was sort of proof of principle that you could directly target with a very specific monoclonal antibody, a specific piece of this innate immune cascade and lower cardiovascular event rates. Um, colchicine is a more broad spectrum drug. It does have a number of anti-neutrophil effects. That's important, by the way. Neutrophils are really becoming very important in atherosclerotic disease progression. Um, it's an indirect inhibitor of the so-called NLRP3 inflammasome, which is where both IL-1, that's the target for canakinumab, and interleukin-6 are upregulated. Um, and as you know, it's been used to treat gout, it's been used to treat pericarditis in high doses in short little bursts. The change here is this use of low-dose colchicine. That's 0.5 milligrams once a day for years uh, to treat chronic stable atherosclerosis. It's very much like using a statin. The idea here is to prevent the progression of the disease by slowing down and maybe stabilizing the plaque. So we had fewer heart attacks and strokes down the road. So it's, it's, it's entering the armamentarium in, at least in my armamentarium, as chronic stable secondary prevention. And that's where the new ACCHA guidelines also put it. Uh, it's really in as a treatment for chronic stable atherosclerosis. And I think that's where it belongs. Yeah, so I think to that point, you know, as we think about the efficacy, I think it's nice, as you outlined, that we have two complementary trials 
um, that are both showing a consistent reduction in, in MACE, one in the post-ACS state and, and one for more chronic uh, patients. So at what point do you think would be the appropriate time to start therapy and who would you be starting it for? Awesome, Michelle, that's a great question. There's a very interesting analysis that just came out from the DOCO2 investigators. It's kind of a landmark analysis. And what they show is that one year, two years, three years, four years since the initiating myocardial infarction, the drug is very effective. So in fact, you could think about starting this drug among your clinic in patients with chronic stable atherosclerotic disease. That's just like we would start a statin in people who had a heart attack some time ago. Um, and that's absolutely fine. I'm using it what I call my frequent flyers. Those patients who just keep coming back, uh, they're already on aggressive lipid lowering therapy. I have them on beta blockers and aspirin and all the usual things. Um, and I say, look, I can get a large risk reduction by starting them on this drug. But a few caveats, Michelle. Like all drugs, colosine comes with some adverse effects. Uh, most of them are pretty rare, but there's some patients I would not give this drug to. Just to be very clear, uh, colosine is cleared by the kidney and by the liver. So patients who have severe chronic kidney disease and severe liver disease, this is a no-go for those patients. Um, and we should talk about where patients in that realm might want to go. And then there's some unusual drugs. Uh, Coldacine is metabolized by the CYP3A4 and the P-glycoprotein pathway. Um, there's a few drugs, ketoconazole, fluconazole, cyclosporin, that if your primary care doctor or internist is going to start one of those drugs for a short term, you probably would want to stop your coldacine for a week or two. But you know, Michelle, people with familial Mediterranean fever, where coldacine is life-saving and life-changing for them, take coldacine for 20, 30, 40 years, there's been no increase in the risk of cancer. There's been very few adverse effects. And I think it's just kind of interesting that we who practice in North America basically never see familial Mediterranean fever. But if we were practicing in Lebanon or Israel or North Africa, this would be a very common therapy that we'd be all extremely familiar with. Yeah, I mean, to that point, you know, it's interesting to hear that coltracine was even used by the ancient Greeks and ancient Egyptians. So it's a drug that's been around for a long time. But in terms of its safety, um, you, you know, some people have been talking about the fact that there was an increase in non-cardiovascular death that was seen um, in Lodoco 2. What are your thoughts on that? And is that anything that we should be concerned about? Sure. So first of all, to set the record straight, uh, there's a meta-analysis been done of all-cause mortality in the various colosine trials, and the hazard ratio is 1.04. And I would remind you, as well as all of us know, the hazard ratios for all-cause mortality in the PCSK9 trials, the methadone acid trials, the acetamide trials are also essentially neutral. So, you know, we're in a st state where we don't let these trials roll long enough to see benefits necessarily on all-cause mortality. Some of us think we probably should, but that's just the reality of trials. One of the most interesting things, I know this is part of the FDA review, I suspect, was that there was no specific cause of any of this. So uh, it was not like there was a set of particular issues. So I suspect that most people think this is probably the play of chance, and with time, things will get better. But again, I do want to emphasize, this is not a drug for severe chronic kidney disease and severe liver disease, because those patients will get in trouble with this. The other thing that's worth knowing is when you start a patient on low-dose colonoscopy, that's 0 0.5 milligrams a day. There are really some patients who get some short-term gastrointestinal upset. That's very common when you start colvacine at much higher doses that you might use to treat acute gout or pericarditis. Um, in these trials, the vast majority of patients treated through that, and there's very little episode long-term. So I think it's generally safe, um, and it's where we're at. And Paul, you've you know been a, a leader, certainly, at, at looking at C-reactive protein as a marker of inflammation. Do you, in your practice, consider C-reactive protein levels when making a decision about in whom is appropriate for this therapy? Michelle, it's not a terrific question. Um, I do, because I'm trying to distinguish in my own mind patients where they have residual inflammatory risk, the, CR, the high sensitivity CRP remains high despite being on statin, versus residual cholesterol risk, where I'm really predominantly worried about LDL that I haven't brought it down far enough. So I do measure it, and if the CRP remains high and the LDL is low, to me, that's residual inflammatory risk, and that's the patient I would target this to. Obversely, if the LDL is still, say, above some threshold, 75 or 100, and I'm worried about that, even if the CRP is low, I'll probably add a second lipid-lowering drug. The complexity of this, however, is that CRPs are actually not measured in either the LADOCO2 or the um, Colcott trials. 
That's mostly because they just didn't have much funding. These trials were done really on a shoestring. They were not sponsored by major pharma at all. Um, but we know that the median HSCRPs in these trials is probably around three and a half to four. So I'm pretty comfortable doing that. Others have just advocated giving it to lots of patients. I must say, I like to use biomarkers to think through the biology and who might this pay the uh, best benefit to risk ratio be. So in my practice, I am doing it that way. Perhaps my last question for you before we wrap up is, you know, you talked about use of low-dose colchicine for patients with more chronic, stable coronary disease. Now, obviously, Colcott um, studied patients who were early post-ACS, and, and there we certainly think about the anti-inflammatory effects as, as potentially having more benefit. So what are your thoughts about early initiation of, of colchicine in that setting, really the acute hospitalized setting, or, or do you think it's more appropriate for um, an outpatient start? Today, Michelle, I think this is all about chronic stable atherosclerosis. Yes, the Colcott trial uh, enrolled their patients within 30 days of a recent myocardial infarction, but as we all know, that's a pretty stable phase, and the vast majority were enrolled after 15 days. There were a small number enrolled within three days or something like that, um, but the benefit is about the same in all these patients. Conversely, there's been a small number of trials looking at colocene and acute coronary ischemia, and they've not been terribly promising. That, does, that makes some sense though, right? We wanna get an artery open. The acute ischemia, that's about uh, revascularization, it's about uh, oxygenation, it's about reperfusion injury. My guess is three, four, five, six days later when it becomes a stable situation is when the drug is probably effective. Again, there will be some ongoing trials of true intervention trials with large sample sizes for acute coronary ischemia. We don't have those yet. So right now, I think this is a therapy for chronic stable angina. But you know, Michelle, that's a lot of our patients. And I would say that if you compare the relative benefit in these trials to, oh, I don't know, adding a Zetamod to a statin, that's a 5 or 6% benefit. PCSK9 inhibitors, we all use them. That's about a 15% benefit. Um, these are 25 to 30% risk reduction. So I think if we're going to think about what's the next drug to give on top of a statin, serious consideration should be given for low-dose colchicine. But let me also emphasize, this is not an either-or situation. This is about the fact that we now understand atherosclerosis to be a disorder both of lipid accumulation and a pro-inflammatory systemic response. We can give these drugs together. And I suspect that base, the best patient care is gonna be very aggressive lipid lowering combined with pretty aggressive inflammation inhibition. And I suspect down the road, that's where all of us are gonna be. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for, for walking us through that today. I think it's a, a very nice, succinct review of the evidence. I and mean, also just sort of getting our, our minds more accustomed to the concept that we can now uh, start to target more orthogonal axes um, that really get at the pathobiology of, of what's going on in the atherosclerotic plaque. So I think it's an important topic. Thanks again for joining me, Paul. Signing, My pleasure. Signing off for Medscape. It's Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue.